this video is going to deal with us finding more limits. So problem number one says consider and graph the function given by this equation. Uh, one of the things you should think about is, is a calculator required or not? And this would be one where you could draw without a calculator. So let's revisit that technique. Uh, the gift is they've already given it to you in factored format. So if you set it, the equation equal to zero and set each factor equal to zero, you can at least find some, some x-intercepts on the graph. And then maybe we can build the graph from there. Well, as a result of setting the factors equal to zero, I have a zero at zero. I have a zero at two and a zero at negative three. Okay, and from here we know the structure of the graph. Uh, this is a cube. If you were to multiply everything together, you'd get the highest exponent of 3. So the graph is going to come up like this, down through here, ah, back up this way. All right, and for our purposes, that's a good enough sketch. We don't have to worry about how high or how low to draw this. Okay, and just kind of pointing out here, this is a well-behaved function. It's continuous. You're never going to lift your pencil to draw this. So um, every functional value is defined. There is a y value for every input, and the limit exists everywhere. And as a matter of fact, in this particular well-behaved function, uh, what we'll see with notation, and we'll spend time on this later, but just to give you a preview, this is just saying that the y value at any c along the x-axis will always equal the limit. Okay, so the limit exists everywhere on all real numbers, and it actually equals the y value, because the graph is well-behaved. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the limits graphically G, numerically N, and analytically A. So G graphically, that means we're going to look at the graph. Um, as X approaches negative 3, notice there's no superscript. So our responsibility is to look at approaching negative 3 from both sides. Uh, we see it's well behaved, so the Y values are going into 0. All right, just kind of a review. Uh, numerically, Let's support that the limit is zero uh, by cranking out some values. So if you have that equation stored in Y1, you can actually go through and find out what the outputs are for each of these inputs. Okay, so on the graph at negative 3.1, we can see the Y coordinate is about negative one and a half. All right, look at negative 3.01. That's back up here, but closer. So should be closer to zero on the negative side. If you crank that out, this is the small little number you're going to get. Maybe. Ah. Okay, so you can see that the regression here is that these numbers are getting closer to zero from the negative side. Okay, let me get the graph back on here. Okay, and then even still closer to negative three, this should even be smaller. It's still negative because we're underneath the x-axis. That's a real small number. That's negative 0 0.015008. If you were to extend this table and have closer x values to negative three, you can see that these are approaching zero. Okay, and then uh, the other side, when we investigate that behavior, um, we're going to be above the x-axis at 2.9, so that should be a positive y value, and it is 1.421. Uh, at negative 2.99, we're even closer. It's still positive, but it's getting closer and closer to zero, and you can see that through the progression of these outputs. Okay, so my, my observation is that um, these values are going into zero from the negative numbers, and these are um, actually going into zero from the positive numbers. So numerically, my data supports that my limit should be zero. All right, the A stands for analytically. Okay, so analytically means try the direct substitution first. Plug in negative 3 everywhere you see X. So uh, negative 3 times negative 3 in here produces a negative 5 out of the binomial. Negative 3 in here gives us a 0. Notice that I've dropped the limit statement when I do that, uh, and so that product is 0. So this answer supports the previous two answers. All right, analytically, let's find a new limit as x approaches 2. So analytically, 
type in 2. 2 minus 2 is 0 in the second or in the second factor, and then 5 right here, but that product is still going to be 0. Alright, so we knew that 2 was a 0 based on our previous observations, so that answer should be 0a. Analytically, what's the limit as x approaches 1? We'll get the graph back in front of you. When you approach 1 from both the left and the right, uh, we see that the graph is underneath the x-axis. I should expect my answer to be negative. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1, and 1 plus 3 is 4, so that product is negative 4. So it looks like you know, that's the point, 1, negative 4 on the graph. All right, analytically at 4, that's going to be a high y value. Think about where 4 is. Let's plug in 4, 4 minus 2, and then 7. Uh, that product is 56. That's going to be pretty high on the graph. But analytically, you just plug the number in. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Oh, I guess we're on the top of the other columns. So let me come back up here. All right, graphically, as x approaches 0 from the left. So I go back to the graph. Here's 0 from the left. My y values are going into 0. All right, so numerically, as x approaches 0 of the function, okay, these numbers should support that I'm getting closer to 0. All right. So there they are, boom. As I approach negative, sorry, as I approach zero from the left, my y values are positive and they're getting closer to zero. So these outputs suggest that this limit is going to go to zero. All right, analytically. All right, what happens when you have a superscript and you're analytically asked to find a limit? Well, just ignore the superscript for a minute. Um, just go ahead and plug in the number. Okay, you don't have to plug in a number close to zero to the left of it. You, a good place to start is just go ahead and plug in zero and see what happens. If I plug in zero, this is the result. That product is zero. Okay, there's nothing interesting about zero. It's a, it's a fine number, so my answer is zero. I didn't have to worry about plugging in um, numbers close to zero to the left of it. It's only if you get like indeterminate or something that you might have to go back and actually plug in real, real weird numbers like up here. All right, graphically, as I approach zero from the right, okay, it uh, looks like my y values are going into zero from the negative side. Okay, you can see where this is going numerically. We've chosen x values to the right of zero, and it appears that these numbers are going to be negative but getting closer to zero. And there they are. Uh, as I approach zero from the right, I can see that uh, my x values are getting, or my y values are getting closer and closer to zero. So um, using all that information, I'm going to say, you know what? Uh, the limit numerically from the data supports that uh, the y values are going into zero. All right, analytically, as I approach zero from the right, again, don't plug in one of these uncomfortable numbers here unless you just absolutely have to. Okay, so if we plug in just zero and we get a nice number out, certainly zero is a nice number, um, then we're done. That's our answer. That product is zero, we're good to go. All right, graphically, notice that uh, now it's still asking us to find the limit as x approaches 0. Well, graphically, from both sides, it means we've considered both sides. We have, I've kind of guided you through this, we get 0. Numerically, as x approaches 0, well, I gave you two data tables previous, and we see the suggestion of those outputs are 0. Okay, analytically, without the superscript, just the limit itself, Okay, we're always going to try and plug in zero, and we saw in the previous two um, analytical limit questions that uh, the answer, the result was zero. All right, so I kind of just took a little bit of a look at left-hand limits, right-hand limits, and then kind of put it all together here. It's kind of a review. All right, let's see what's on the back. All right, so we have a new um, graph to consider. Uh, it says, consider and graph the function given by... And here we now have a rational function as opposed to a polynomial function. Uh, example one was a polynomial function. This is a rational function. All right, but notice the comparison of problem one and problem two. As you can see, the numerator of this fraction, okay, with the exception of this additional x minus two factor, is the same as problem number one. Well, notice that I built, purposely built, this to be a fraction by including an extra binomial x minus two. Okay, I could have included anything here as an extra common factor, but I decided to include x minus 2 here. Alright, so when I take a look at this, it's, it's 
you know, been factored for us, we can see what's happening. I do know that I'm going to be able to cancel these common factors and look at the resulting factors that are, are left. That's, in fact, example number one on the front. All right, so if I graphed example number one on the front, uh, that's fine, but I have to make an adjustment for the um, point of discontinuity at x equals two. I'm trying to produce about the same graph, so just kind of bear with me here. Okay, so what I did is I produced the same graph as what's on the front, but I have to make the observation that I'm going to have an open circle here, a point of discontinuity at x equals 2. So even though I went ahead and drew through it, okay, let me go back in and, if you will, erase that point. So consider that to be a point discontinuity. So um, the graph is continuous everywhere except for at x equals 2, where we have a point discontinuity. Okay, so that's our whole. Okay, so kind of interesting, same as number one, we just have the point discontinuity here. All right, so this worksheet structured a little bit differently. Um, so on the right-hand side right here, um, those are the questions we want to answer. It says numerically, as x approaches 2, what's happening? Well, plug in each of these x values into the equation, these also, and see what the data suggests right here. Okay, I can certainly see that um, it appears that my y values are going into zero, even though the point's not there. Okay, so here we go, the completed tables. We can see the progression is that these values are going into zero from the negative um, numbers. Makes sense, the graph's coming up here. And that these y values are getting closer to zero by walking down the graph. Okay, so I would say that the limit is going to zero, even though the point's not there. And that's the point of this question is, it might be discontinuous, the limit still can exist. Now the functional value, before we move to example three, let's just revisit. If you were asked what's f of two, we would say d and e, and we would say because no y or x. No output for the input. There's not even a random point lined up, okay? But the limit can certainly exist even though the function's not defined, and that's the point of this, again, just to review that. Okay, let's look at example three, because I'm taking the same problem, but just making some, some different features on it. All right, so look at number three. Actually, it's a piecewise function. The top piece is example two. So now we know what to draw, example two. And the bottom piece is actually just a point. So whereas example two wasn't, the function wasn't defined at, at two, um, for example three, the function is going to be defined at two, and it's uh, going to be negative three. So I'm just putting in a random point, okay, at the x value of two. So I'm trying to recreate that graph here. And there it is. Example number two with the point at two, negative three. All right, so here's the question right here. What's the limit of the function as x approaches two? Well, don't be distracted by this point right here. The y values as I approach two are still going into zero. This is not the functional value question. Let me just kind of off to the side, write that. This is not this question. What's f of two? Because if it was, when x is 2, the y is negative 3, and that's the only time. Okay, y is negative 3 <clears throat> is when x is 2, and that's just uh, different from the limit question. Okay, um, I might suggest that you might want to type in example 2 into the calculator, hit the trace key, and hit 2. And when you hit 2, uh, up at the bottom, you'll see x equals 2, y equals, and it'll be blank. Just to remind yourself about the calculator and what you can do with that, some kind of exploration. All right, let's look at example four. All right, you, you're familiar with this graph. This is the here and there. Uh, it's just been translated to the left two. So our point of discontinuity, if you think about it, when you plug in negative two, you're going to get zero over zero. That's indeterminate. And what that means is, remember, that's indeterminate. Okay, you're either going to have a jump discontinuity or a point discontinuity. And the graph will reveal which of those two. All right, so we have negative 2 is where our function is undefined or does not exist because there's no y for the x. Here's negative 2. All right, so we did that. All right, so graphically, what's the limit as x approaches negative 2? Well, I'm going to actually have you consider approaching negative 2 from both the left and the right. So 
Remember, without the superscript, it's our responsibility to look at approaching negative 2 from the left and x values getting closer to negative 2 from the right. So graphically, we can see because of that jump discontinuity that the function just does not exist because the left limit is negative 1, whereas the right limit is positive 1. All right, numerically, all right, let's fill in this table right here and see what the limit is. Well, it should be D and E, but we'll let the data support that. So you might want to pause the video, take each of these, plug it into the equation, and get the outputs. All right, pardon my messy kind of handwriting. It's just with the stylus. So, you know, in, in person, it, it's much better. And you practice good, you know, handwriting, too. All right, if x is negative 2 or to the left of negative 2, I should say, uh, as indicated by these first three x values, um, all my outputs are going to be negative 1. You can take turns and plug each of those in here and see that you're going to get a negative 1. Now, if I'm to the right of negative 2, then I'm up here, and then all my answers are going to come out as 1. All right, so um, we can certainly see that this is a DNE. The numbers support it, not just the graph, but the numbers. Analytically, all right, if I plug in negative 2 from the right, remember what I said earlier, just go ahead and try negative 2 and see what happens. Well, I'm going to get 0 over 0. Well, that's not a nice number, so this requires further investigation, like what I mentioned. So analytically, then what you do is you have to get down to um, more uncomfortable numbers. All right, so a number to the right side of negative 2, right, well, that would be like negative 1.9. Okay, I'm going to approach negative 2 from the right on the g function, and the g function's up here. So um, let's use uh, negative 1.9, I guess. Negative 1.9 plus 2, but that's the absolute value over the same thing here. All right, so my numerator is going to be, um, what, 0.1, and my denominator is going to be 0.1. So uh, same number on top, same number on bottom. So my right-hand limit is 1. So this answer is going to be 1. It was indeterminate. I had to come up with a backup plan, and that's what I found. Let's at the left-hand limit. Uh, same idea. I know when I plug in negative 2, I'm going to get indeterminate, just like up here. So um, let me do this. The limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of the g function. I guess I didn't need to rewrite it. Uh, a number to the left of negative 2 would be like negative 2.1 plus the 2 absolute value. Okay, and notice what's going to happen on top, right? Okay, you're always going to get positive, so it's 0.1. But in the bottom, because we don't have um, absolute value, we are going to get a negative. So a number divided by its opposite is going to be negative 1. All right, so analytically, um, we had to kind of dig in a little deeper when we got indeterminate. Uh, we found the left and right-hand limits, and they agree with what we found numerically. We're just doing it by hand. All right, so considering the same function up here, let's just answer these questions real quickly. What, what's the limit as x approaches 5? Well, 5 is over here. Uh, and whether I'm on the left or right-hand side of 5, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm at a y value of 1. It's at 0. Uh, the output's 1. Negative 3 puts me over here, and closer to negative 3 from either side would be on the negative 1 branch. As x goes to infinity, my y's will always be 1, and as x goes to negative infinity, my y's will always be negative 1. Okay. A few final questions here. All right, we've been finding where limits don't exist, but what happens if the question is where does the limit exist? All right, so for graph number one, it appeared that the um, function, the limit existed on all real numbers. So the proper way to respond to, be, uh, to that would be the limit of the function as x approaches c exists on all real numbers. All right, well, look at number two. Number two only had the hole in it, but the limit still existed. Uh, the function isn't defined for every x, but the limit will exist at every x value. So um, actually, I'm going to put 2 right here, and this will be 3. The limit existed of the function on all real numbers. All 
All right, and look at uh, number three, graph number three. Uh, same thing, didn't matter that that point just all of a sudden appeared. The limit of the function as x approaches any x value exists on all real numbers. Okay, and the last problem, that last graph right there, the here and there, the only place that the graph um, doesn't have a limit that exists would be at negative 2 where the jump discontinuity is. So let's pull out negative 2 from all real numbers. I should have exists here. All right, so hopefully in this video some things were solidified for you. Um, and if not, we'll have a, have a chance to talk about it next, next we meet.